Listen, just one more thing. Uh... Hello there. Welcome to my review of episode 8 of season 3 of Columbo, A Friend Indeed. First broadcast on May the 5th, 1974 on NBC. It was written by returning writer Peter S. Fisher and directed by Ben Gazzara. Gazzara was born Biagio Anthony Gazzara on August the 28th, 1930, in New York. The son of Italian immigrants in an Italian-speaking household meant he didn't learn English until he was in school. He studied electrical engineering at City College before taking up acting lessons at the dramatic workshop of the new school. He attributed his love of acting for keeping him away from a life of crime. He began his professional acting career in small television roles and larger roles on Broadway. Due to the success in the theatre, he turned down many film roles before eventually appearing in The Strange One and then Anatomy of a Murder, although his film appearances would remain sparse. He starred in the TV series Arrest and Trial and Run for Your Life in the 60s and finished the decade with a starring role in Bridget Remagen. In the 70s he began to collaborate with his friends John Cassavetes and Peter Falk in films such as Husbands, The Killing of a Chinese Bookie and Opening Night. He also established a working relationship with Peter Bogdanovich at this time, appearing in his films Saint Jack and They All Laughed. In the 80s he continued to make films in the US and in Europe, but is perhaps most well known at this time for playing the villain in Roadhouse. In the 90s he would regularly cameo in films from some of the most influential directors of that decade, including The Big Lebowski for the Coen Brothers, Summer of Sam for Spike Lee, The Spanish Prisoner for David Mamet, and The Thomas Crown Affair for John McTiernan. In the 2000s he continued in theatre and film, with his final appearance being in The Wait in 2012. He died on February the 3rd, 2012. He was 81. The episode begins with a man phoning a woman who is in bed. The caller is Hugh Caldwell, played by Michael Maguire, perhaps most famous for playing Sumner Sloan in Cheers and he's trying to get hold of the lady's husband, Mark Halperin. When he gets off the phone, it's revealed there's a body on the floor of the room he's in. He's clearly distressed by the situation. He leaves and, on the instructions of Halperin's wife, finds Halperin at his regular backgammon game at his club with a young lady. This is a really clever way of introducing the character by showing his wife first uh, in a perfectly logical way and then showing his potential lover. This immediately makes the audience aware that uh, Halperin is probably the villain. Mark Halperin is played by Richard Kiley. Kiley was born on the 31st of March 1922 in Chicago. He studied at the Barnum Dramatic School before his career was interrupted by World War II. After the war, he moved to New York to perform on stage before making a splash in the television play Patterns, written by Rod Serling. He would have a small but memorable role as math teacher Joshua Edwards in Blackboard Jungle and win a Tony for playing the dual role of Cervantes and Don Quixote in Man of La Mancha. More awards would follow, winning an Emmy and Golden Globe for his roles in The Thornbirds and A Year in the Life, and would be heard but not seen by audiences all over the world, providing the voice of the narrator of the tour in Jurassic Park. The voice you're now hearing is Richard Kiley. <laughs> we spared no expense. If you look to the right, you will see a herd of the first dinosaurs on our tour, called Dilophosaurus. He died on March the 5th, 1999. 
he was 76. Caldwell asks to speak to him and, in private, explains what happened during an argument with his wife. Caldwell killed her in a blind rage, and Halperin then finds out more exact details before advising him how they are going to cover up the murder. He is to stay at the club while Halperin goes to his place. Caldwell is then to call his home from the club and Halperin will answer, pretending to be Caldwell's wife, establishing his alibi. Halperin breaks in and arranges the scene so it looks like Caldwell's wife was in bed and had been disturbed by a burglar who killed her. He then goes home and it's revealed that his wife is independently wealthy and they disagree significantly about their politics. He uses this as an opportunity to claim he sees a man running from the Caldwell house establishing that the Caldwells and the Halperins are neighbours. He calls the police, and it's then revealed that he's a deputy commissioner. He asks the police to check out the house. There have been a spate of burglaries in the area. Columbo arrives at the scene after the police have found the body. He's in the commissioner's car, which he has dropped his cigar in. Oh, I got it. I grabbed the wrong end. The Commissioner is already on the scene. This is a, another interesting and original idea from the writers, as we don't ever see much of the inner workings of Columbo's precinct. Pitting him against one of his superiors, who surely must know how good Columbo is, should provide for an intriguing episode. The other cops on the scene think it happened exactly how Halperin wants them to think it happened, but, as we've seen many times before, Columbo has some issues. They found Mrs. Caldwell in her nightwear, but he finds a second nighty under her pillow. The next day, Halperin is giving a press conference, and watching on the TV is Artie Jessup, the burglar who was actually the one working the area, but of course he's not the murderer. He's played by a returning actor and friend of Peter Falk's, Val Avery. He meets with his fence, who won't take any more of his goods because of the police presence around this case. By the sheer length of this sequence, it's pretty clear that this is going to be another 90-minute episode, and already you get the sense that there's some padding here. But anyway, Columbo visits Halperin's house and surprises Mrs. Halperin while she's gardening. He asks about the rumours surrounding Mrs. Caldwell's affairs. She says she knew of them, but not any of the men in question. She also says that she didn't see a burglar, only her husband did. He then heads to the Caldwell residence where Caldwell is looking pretty haunted. Columbo asks about the events of the evening of the murder, and Caldwell gives his fake version of events. And Columbo can't understand why his wife's fingerprints weren't on the closet door where her nightie was. Caldwell explains this away because his wife kept her nightclothes under her pillow. But Columbo is one step ahead, something Halperin obviously wasn't. Columbo then goes to speak to Halperin, who is far too busy for Columbo, until he mentions that he spoke to Halperin's wife, which briefly stops Halperin in his tracks. He goes home and interrupts his wife in the most 1970s bath you're ever likely to see. He chats with her briefly before drowning her in the bathtub. We then cut to Mrs. Caldwell's funeral where Halperin speaks to Caldwell, coldly commenting his wife is at home. Where's Margaret? She's at home. Halperin asks Caldwell for a favour in return, and demands Caldwell assist him in the same way, by pretending to be the burglar and getting spotted fleeing his house while Halperin is on helicopter patrol of the area. 
essentially a better worked out alibi version of the first murder. During the patrol, Halperin says he spots someone at his house and Caldwell, dressed all in black, runs out of the house with the body of Mrs Halperin, who he drops into their swimming pool. Halperin leaps into fake action, jumping from the helicopter to rescue his wife as the other cops arrive, but as he knows, she's already dead. At this stage, there are several big mistakes Halperin has made. Firstly, any coroner should be able to spot the wife drowned in bath water, not pool water, and there is no sign of forced entry. Although, kudos to Halperin as he suggests the man came back to kill her because he mistakenly gave the impression his wife had also seen the intruder. Columbo is deeply suspicious of this, though. Of all these things, plus the fact that he was asked for before it was certain a murder had been committed makes Columbo incredibly suspicious. Columbo is clearly on to Halperin and now it's just a question of details. He checks the bath which is naturally completely dry. He then wonders why the burglar didn't take Mrs Caldwell's ring but the sergeant explains that it was a fake which a pro would have spotted immediately. He then asks the coroner to check whether she drowned in bath water or not, although the coroner says it's unlikely he will be able to tell. Uh, I don't think that's really correct here, um, but that's only based on other crime shows so it might not be true. The next day Columbo goes to Halperin and tells him he thinks it's someone trying to make it look like a burglar because they didn't find Mrs Caldwell's fingerprints anywhere and someone else dressed her, someone other than Mr Caldwell because he knew she kept her nightgown under her pillow. Columbo then suggests to Halperin that it might have been one of her lovers. Halperin tries to steer him back to the burglar ruse which obviously doesn't work. Watching Columbo dance around the man who is effectively his boss is a fresh idea for the show. Where Columbo can usually get away with being more direct when he needs to be, sometimes to the point of being cheeky with his suspects, he can't do here. Um, even though Halperin is far less intelligent than some of the people he comes across. Halperin's already made far too many mistakes in trying to cover up the two murders to the point where when he's gifted with the idea of it being somebody else and not the people who did it he throws that away to direct Columbo back onto the idea of a burglar which Columbo has already had good reason to dismiss. We know who did it and we know they will be caught as always but Columbo is having to use far different tactics here to pursue his quarry. His case has to be more ironclad. He goes to a jeweller's and is greeted by returning Columbo actor Arlene Martel, last seen in The Greenhouse Jungle, although in a much reduced role here for a fun scene of Columbo seeing how the other half live. He then speaks to the manager about Mrs Caldwell's jewellery he discovers that she had sold off all of her jewellery because Caldwell had cut off her funds and she needed money to continue her affairs. This further proves it was no burglar because if he left the fake ring he would have left the rest of the fake jewellery. Columbo then speaks to her most recent lover who explains he was supposed to meet her the night she was killed but there was no answer at her home at 9.30, so he took someone else out. What a delightful young man. He returns to Halperin and is playing a very risky game now. Columbo tells Halperin he thinks the time of death is wrong because there was no answer at 9.30, and that's just the start of unravelling Halperin's plot. Without naming Halperin specifically, he lays out what really happened. 
but Halperin once again tries to throw him off. As he leaves, he gets a call from the coroner. No chlorine in her lungs, but there was soap. So it's right what I suspected. Apparently, both Columbo and myself know more than this particular coroner. He speaks to the officer in charge of burglaries, who tells him that if it wasn't for the murders, the earlier burglaries sound like the work of Artie Jessup who has an alibi for the nights of both murders. Columbo then goes to speak to Artie, who he shows the ring to, which Artie spots immediately as a fake. Columbo then tells Artie that he's a cop, and Artie angrily denies having anything to do with it, which Columbo says he already knows. Artie doesn't know who did it, Columbo says he does, but needs Artie's help to prove it. He gets Artie to blackmail Caldwell, who then tells Halperin. Halperin tells him to meet Artie and to find out what he wants, while Halperin waits nearby. After the meet, Halperin tells Caldwell to prepare to pay Artie off. Halperin goes to burglary division and Columbo is there waiting. Halperin looks through the suspect's file and finds Artie's details, then leaves. He gathers the jewellery he took from Caldwell's and heads to Artie's apartment and plants them there. Caldwell meets Artie and Halperin makes sure the police arrive, including Columbo. Artie is arrested and Halperin takes Columbo and some other officers to Artie's apartment with a warrant he already has prepared. Columbo very graciously tries to warn him he's making a mistake. Commissioner, I believe you're making a mistake here, sir. Sir. But Halperin thinks he's won. At the apartment, Columbo tells him Mrs. Halperin died in the bath. As he's explaining the whole scheme to Halperin and accusing him of murder, they find the jewels. Seemingly, exonerating Halperin, and potentially getting Columbo into a lot of trouble. However, at this point Columbo brings Artie in, who explains it's not his apartment. In fact, everything in the apartment belongs to Lieutenant Columbo, who just started renting the place. He doesn't live here. I live here. The only way the jewels could have got there is if Halperin put them there. Starting at the end, this is a superb gotcha, and really the only way to catch the killer they've created. It works perfectly. The pacing is good, not as good as previous 90 Minutes episodes, um, and the filler is fairly obvious, but it's not too bad and doesn't have too many of the unnecessarily overlong scenes padding the running time. It might have been nice to have a little more of Caldwell, slowly unravelling as he's clearly actually distraught by what he did and wants to confess, whereas Halperin remains cold-blooded from start to finish. That's something I feel we're missing. The performances are all excellent, although Due to who the killer is, there's less fun to be had with the interplay between him and Columbo, because Columbo has to walk on eggshells for most of these encounters. Maybe its biggest weakness is the fact that it's a little generic and doesn't really need to be Columbo investigating. If there had been a little more about their working relationship, as Halperin barely knows who Columbo is, it might have worked a little better, and I know it wasn't the done thing at the time, but it might have been funny if Halperin had been introduced in an earlier episode or two. Overall, it's a pretty solid episode that I enjoyed much more than the last time I watched it, but it didn't quite grab me the way other episodes have. For that reason, I have to give it a 3 out of 5. It's a very watchable episode, but is fairly unspectacular. Thank you. Goodbye.